Hello, welcome to the class on E540 Advanced Electromagnetic Theory and Antennas. I am Professor Rakesh Singh Satrame. So, in this class, we will discuss about the Hort antennas. So, firstly, we will discuss about what is motivation behind uh, converting the antennas we have considered in the previous class into horn antennas. We will consider three motivations for that. So let's look at the first motivation. The first motivation is proper impedance matching between the waveguide and the free space. So we are considering a hollow rectangular waveguide which is operating in the dominant T10 mode. So for different modes, there will be different wave impedance for the waveguide. What we are considering is the dominant T10 mode. We can easily find out the wave impedance for the dominant T10 mode. So what is the wave impedance for the dominant T10 mode? You can find out it from this relation you have here. Wave impedance for the T mode is given as eta naught divided by square root of 1 minus Fc by F whole square. F is the operating frequency, Fc is the cutoff frequency for that mode inside the waveguide. Eta naught is the wave impedance for free space. If your waveguide is having eta naught, then free space is also having eta naught. There is no reflection. All the signals which come through the waveguide will be radiated efficiently without any reflection. But here you can see that in order that to happen then cutoff frequency for the waveguide should be equal to zero. And you know that waveguide usually have a very high cutoff frequency. Let us see what is the cutoff frequency for the dominant T10 mode inside the rectangular waveguide. We'll consider one standard waveguide and find out what is the cutoff frequency for the dominant T10 mode inside the waveguide. Waveguide is basically a high pass filter. Signals start propagating from one particular frequency which is called the cutoff frequency. So in the high pass filter, the cutoff frequency is the frequency at which your waveguide will start propagating signals. Before the cutoff frequency, if you are sending a signal which is below the cutoff frequency, waveguide is a stop band filter, filter. But if you send a signal which is greater than equal to the cutoff frequency for the waveguide, then waveguide will be a high pass filter. So cutoff frequency plays a significant role inside the waveguide and I am aware that many of you know what is waveguide by now. You must have done this kind of study in your undergraduate studies. So let us try to find out the cutoff frequency for the <coughs> dominant T10 mode inside the web. Uh, let us consider the expand waveguide. Expand waveguide usually have mode operating frequency from 8 to 12 gigahertz. So let's see what is the cutoff frequency for the standard expand waveguide of dimension A is equal to 22.86 millimeter, B is equal to 10.16 millimeter. So cutoff frequency for the dominant T10 mode can be found out from this relation. You can easily derive this. Cutoff frequency is equal to 1 by 2a square root of mu epsilon. 1 by square root of mu epsilon. Now we are considering a hollow metallic waveguide. So inside the waveguide there is free space. So this will become 1 by square root of mu naught epsilon naught. That is the speed of light C. So the formula reduced to C by 2A for a hollow rectangular waveguide. You know what is A here? A is 22.86 millimeter. You know the speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 8. You can find out the cutoff frequency. For this particular expand waveguide with this given dimensions, the cutoff frequency is 6.56 gigahertz. It's not even close to zero. It's very high in the gigahertz range. We usually use waveguide for the gigahertz range of operation. So now, in the previous formula for the wave impedance for dominant T10 mode, you can 
plug in this value of cutoff frequency and assume that your waveguide is operating around 10 gears you want to send signal around 10 gears what is the wave impedance so the wave impedance if you calculate it the wave impedance for this case when the waveguide is operating at 10 gears with a cutoff frequency of 6.56 gears the wave impedance for dominant t10 mode is around 500 499 ohm and you know that what is the wave impedance for free space wave impedance for free space is 377 ohm so you can clearly see that 499 and 377 there's a lot of difference the signal which was propagating inside the waveguide in the dominant t10 mode when it comes to the open ended waveguide no? at the end of the waveguide what it sees is free space free space is 377 ohm so load is 377 ohm so now you know that reflection coefficient gamma capital gamma is zl minus z naught by zl plus z naught so the load now is 377 ohm z naught will be wave impedance for the waveguide free uh, wave impedance for the waveguide for the dominant t10 mode so 377 minus 499 divided by 377 plus 499 and it turns out to be minus 0 0.139 that is potent person no? so now when we consider an open-ended waveguide as an antenna the reflection coefficient around 14 percent so signal will get reflected at the boundary where you have the open-ended waveguide but we don't want to have any kind of reflection so antenna to radiate efficiently all the signals should be radiated without any reflection so how can we achieve that let's say if we increase the dimension a five times this dimension a of the waveguide five times in that case a will become 114.33 millimeter since you know that the cutoff frequency is defined as c by 2a i have increased a five times so the cutoff frequency will reduce five times what is the new cutoff frequency the new cutoff frequency is simply 1.311 gigahertz when we increase the dimension of the waveguide a five times the new cutoff frequency is simply 1.311 gigahertz and you have the relation for the wave impedance for dominant t10 mode this is the relation wave impedance defined as eta naught divided by the square root of 1 minus fc by f whole square i know what is the new fc i know what is f f is 10 gigahertz fc is 1.311 gigahertz in that case i can find out the wave impedance for the new waveguide we have designed with a five times that of the x-band waveguide what we observe is the wave impedance is 380 ohm so 380 ohm is very close to 377 ohm which is the wave impedance for the free space so now the reflection coefficient will be 377 minus 380 divided by 377 plus 380 so it turns out to be minus 0 0.00396 almost no reflection so when i increase the aperture size of the open-ended waveguide what i'm observing is that reflection has been reduced impedance matching is more proper so that is the basic idea be behind you know clearing out the aperture of the waveguide to make horn antenna so this is the first motivation when i flare out the waveguide and make the aperture of the waveguide open-ended waveguide larger and larger what i'm seeing is that impedance matching is becoming proper and proper we have taken one particular case of when the I increase the E of the X pen waveguide, which is one of the standard waveguide, E five times. What I am observing is that there is no reflection. So this is one of the first motivation for making the horn antenna from the open-ended waveguide. What is the second motivation? The second motivation is the directivity enhancement. When I increase the aperture of the waveguide. 
directivity increases. What was the directivity for an open-ended waveguide? For the open-ended waveguide, directivity was 4 pi by lambda squared 0.81 AB. Let us say if I increase A is 2 times, B is 2 times, what happens to the directivity? Directivity will increase 4 times. So if you keep on increasing the aperture of the open-ended waveguide, directivity is increasing. So that's a good thing. First thing was impedance was properly matched. Second is directivity is also increasing. So this is the second motivation for making horn antennas from the open-ended waveguide. We have one more motivation, which is the third motivation. So the third motivation is about the radiation pattern. We have the E-plane radiation pattern for open-ended waveguide. This is the expression. It's a sync function with the argument beta B by 2 sine theta. So now, for an open-ended waveguide, E-plane pattern is decided by this sync function here. So let us try to explore what is the property of sync function when I keep on changing this argument here. So let's say if I increase this argument five times, what happens to the sync function plot? So that's what this plot is about. I have two plots. This plot is for the sync function. I have another plot, this one. This one is for the sync 5x function. So here I have increased the argument five times. So what you can clearly observe is when I uh, increase the argument of the sync function five times, the radiation pattern becomes very narrow. So if I keep on increasing the aperture size of the open-ended waveguide, what I will see is that beam will become more narrower and narrower. It will become a pencil beam later on. So we have three motivations for making horn antennas from the open-ended waveguide. First is proper impedance matching. Second is directivity enhancement. Third is narrower beam. Is that okay? So let us make horn antenna from open-ended waveguide after knowing these three advantages we have. So this is the structure of an open-ended waveguide. And uh, this x-axis, this is y-axis, z-axis is coming out from the computer screen. So now dimension, this is A, this is B. So now, how do I make horn antenna from open-ended waveguide? That's the basic question you, we are going to study now. How do I make horn antenna from the open-ended waveguide? There are three possibilities. First possibility, first possibility is I keep this dimension A fixed and increase this dimension small b to capital B. So I'll denote this larger dimension by A capital B and smaller dimension by small b. So this is the dimension of the waveguide, open-ended waveguide. When I increase this small b to capital B, what we have is called E-plan sectoral hole. Why E-plan? Because you see, where is the E-plan of the open-ended waveguide? It's along the yz direction. And we are increasing the dimension along the yz direction, along the y direction. So we call it E-plan sectoral hole. Similarly, I can also keep this dimension fixed and increase this dimension. So, B is fixed, but small a becomes capital A, it becomes larger. So, in that case, I plane is in the XZ plane. So, what we are increasing is the X dimension of the waveguide. So, we call it I plane sectoral horn. And moreover, we can actually increase both A and B. You know? A and B, if we increase it, the aperture dimension is going to become larger and larger. So if I increase both A and B, then what we get is something called pyramidal horn. This is the standard pyramidal horn where you have dimension along the x-axis is capital A, dimension along the y-axis is capital B. So these are the three particular way of making horn antenna from the open-ended rectangular waveguide. We'll study them one by one in this lecture and in the following lecture also.
Let us first consider the ice plane sectoral horn. So this is the ice plane sectoral horn side view exit cut. No? We are looking at side view exit cut. So now this diagram is the diagram for the ice plane sectoral horn antenna. See we are actually feeding the ice plane sectoral horn using a waveguide. This portion is the waveguide portion and this portion is the sectoral horn antenna portion. So now the dimension of the waveguide is A here along the x axis and dimension of the horn antenna this is called the mouth of the horn antenna this dimension is capital A as you know that I have increased the dimension of waveguide to capital A to get the horn antenna ice plane sectoral horn antenna so this is the mouth of the waveguide this dimension is capital A and the point where you are connecting the waveguide and the horn antenna is called the neck of the waveguide the neck of the horn antenna So this and this is the neck of the horn antenna. So now in order to make the horn antenna from the waveguide you need to flare it out. You need to flare it out. This angle here is called the theta i's is called the flaring angle. And this length here due to the flaring is called the flaring, flaring length. L i's is the flaring length. So this point, see basically your horn antenna is like this. You have metals here, you have metals here, you have metals here. This is where guide, this is also metal here. But this line here we are connecting here is imaginary line. This doesn't exist. But we call this line where these two lines are joining as face center of the waveguide because face calculation starts from this point. So here we'll have one coordinate system which is x, y, z. Y is coming out of this computer screen. And we actually consider this aperture, the mouth of the horn antenna as the source for radiation. We find the fills here and find the radiated fills from the horn antenna. So now this is the location of the source. So we have one more coordinate system here which is x, j, y dash z dash so all the source coordinates are with the prime coordinates observation coordinates are with the unprimed coordinates we assume that this horn antenna is giving us a spherical wave front so this is the one of the spherical wave front what you can observe is that if we assume that there is a plane wave front here this is spherical wave front and plane wave front after we assume there is a plane wave front here there is some error here because of that assumption that error is given by delta so delta is the path difference if we consider this center point here there is no error when we assume the spherical wave front and plane wave front they are meeting here so this line r not theirs doesn't have any phase error but if we consider any distance x theirs from the origin at the point p theirs when I assume a spherical wavefront by plane wavefront, there is some error here. So that error is R1 dash minus R0 dash. So that is equal to delta. That is called the path difference. That path difference will give us uh, phase error. So you can observe that phase error is zero here. Phase error is maximum here because look at these two distance. This maximum here is zero here. So these are the phase front. So I believe I have defined all the parameters here. So let's go to the next slide. So the question is how do, what are the dimensions we need to calculate for designing horn antennas? So the two dimensions we need for construction of horn antenna is A and the RH. A is the mouth, how much is the dimension of the mouth of the horn antenna? RH will give us how much is the extension from the neck to the mouth? Distance between the mouth and neck of the horn antenna is given by RS. If I have RS and the, this dimension, A, capital A, then I can easily construct this horn antenna in the left. So I need to find out A and RS to construct a horn antenna in the left. 
you can find out these dimensions from simple geometrical relations you have for the ice plane sectoral horn antenna. First thing is that this flare angle. Look at this flare angle. At this line, this would be theta ice by 2. What is 10 theta ice by 2? 10 theta ice by 2 is opposite by base. Opposite is from here to here is A by 2. Base is R not there. So if I want to find theta ice, I can find S 2 times 10 inverse A by 2 R not there. I can also find out what is flaring length L is. L is by using Pythagoras theorem L is square is equal to A by 2 square plus R not square. This is the second relation. Then third relation is the distance between the neck and mouth. You know, this R is here. So we want to find capital A and R is. So R is can be found out from this relation. This is a standard relation. R is is capital A minus A square root of L is by A whole square minus 1 by 4. But I think many of the students struggle in finding out this relation. These two relations are very simple. This is also simple, but just looking at the diagram, you cannot come up with this relation here. You need to do a little bit of derivation here. That we'll do in the next slide. So the question is, how do we get the last equation? So you can easily get it from the geometrical relations of this sectoral horn antenna, ice plane sectoral horn antenna. What is 10 theta ice by 2? 10 theta ice by 2 is A by 2 divided by R naught there. You consider this portion, this is at the mouth portion of the horn antenna. You also consider this neck portion of the horn antenna. You still have 10 theta ice by 2 here. That will be this opposite by base here. How much is this opposite? This opposite is half of A, so A by 2. How much is this length here? You know this length, this is R0 there, this is RH, so this length from here to here will be R0 there minus RH. So 10 of theta 2, theta x by 2 can be also expressed as A by 2 R0 there minus RH. So from this relation, we can get the previous relation. How do you get it? You invert it, this relation in the right hand side, you invert it and cancel the two com common terms. So 2, 2 can be cancelled out, you invert it bring the denominator to numerator numerator to denominator so r naught dash by a is equal to r naught dash minus r is by small a r naught dash by capital a is equal to r naught dash minus r is by small a if you cross multiply it this and this and this what do you get a r naught dash minus capital a r naught dash minus capital a r h we are interested in finding RH, so I will take this term to the left hand side. A RH is equal to capital A minus capital A minus small a R not this. And I will take this term to the right hand side. So we can find out RH as capital A minus A R not this by A. What is R not this? R not this is basically L A square minus A by 2S whole square. So L is square square root of A L is square minus A square by 4. So we have A here, A also here. You take out common. In that case, R is simply reduced to capital A minus A square root of L is by capital A whole square minus 1 by 4. That is the exact relation we have in the previous slide, this relation here. So you can easily get this relation for finding the R H. And you can also find out A, capital A. So if you have capital A and R is, you can construct this horn antenna inside the lab. Okay, so we are interested in finding the fill pattern of the horn antenna. As usual, we need to know the fill pattern of the any kind of antennas. So for this horn antenna, also we want to find the fill patterns. So in order to find the fill patterns, we need to find out how much is the phase change. How much is the phase change? <coughs> so how much is the phase change from going from here to here? You'll have zero phase change here. After I approximate this spherical wavefront by a plane wavefront, there is no phase change here. 
but if I keep on moving along the XTS axis, phase keeps on increasing till the end of the horn antenna. So if I consider one particular point P dash here and find out how much is the phase change from the center point of the mouth of the uh, horn antenna, how much is the phase change when I move a distance of X dash at location P dash. That's what we are supposed to do now. We want to find out how much is the phase change. So if you want to find the phase change, you need to find out how much is the path difference first. The path difference from the central part and at the distance x dash is r1 dash minus r0 dash. That is your delta in the figure. Delta was path difference which is r1 dash minus r0 dash. r1 dash is at the location x dash from the center of the mouth of the horn antenna. So this is what you have here. This delta is R1 dash minus this is R0 dash. So this delta is R1 dash minus R0 dash. I want to find that. So let us try to find that. So what is R1 dash? You can use Pythagoras theorem. What is R1 dash? R1 dash is this length is basically this length square plus this length square square root of that. This is x dash, this is r0 dash, so we can find out what is r1 dash. r1 dash is square root of r0 dash square plus x dash square. So if I take out r0 dash common, then what I have is 1 plus x dash by r0 dash whole square to the power half, square root of that. So use... Uh, binomial expansion for this and take up to the second term what you have here is r0 dash is equal to r1 dash is equal to r0 dash 1 plus half x dash by r0 whole square so if i take this r0 dash to the left hand side what i have is r1 dash minus r0 dash approximately equal to 1 by 2 r0 dash x dash whole square so at one particular location p dash at a distance x dash from the center of the mouth of the horn antenna what i am seeing is that the path difference is r1 dash minus r0 dash is 1 by 2 r0 dash x dash square so once i have the path difference i can find out the phase change so delta becomes 1 by 2 r0 dash x dash whole square so you can observe that this path length is quadratic having quadratic variation with respect to x dash so the phase will also have quadratic variation with respect to x dash. So we say that for the horn antenna, there is a quadratic phase variation. So let us look at that. First step in finding the fills radiated from aperture antenna is find the fills inside the aperture of the antenna. So now you know what is the phase variation. You know what is the amplitude variation of the fills in the mouth of the horn antenna you can write it down now a pressure field variation would be e a y it will have only y component just like that of the fit web guide so it becomes e0 we are considering dominant t10 mode e0 cosine of pi x dash by capital a you know? see we are considering the mouth of the horn antenna so the dimension was capital a so a small a has been replaced by capital a small a was the dimension of the fit wave guide but now at the mouth of the horn antenna it becomes capital a so the field variation is e naught cosine of pi x dash by a this is the amplitude variation and phase variation would be exponential minus j beta delta delta is 1 by 2 r naught dash x dash square so the phase variation is exponential minus j beta 1 by 2 r naught dash x dash whole square so we also have the amplitude variation and phase variation. We know what is the field variation at the mouth of the horn antenna. So we know the aperture field. This is the first step for finding the radiated field from the aperture antenna. So just before that, uh, going to the second step, let us try to understand the behavior of this amplitude and phase variation of the fill in the mouth of the horn antenna. Amplitude variation is 
E0 cosine of pi x dash by A. So what will be the field at the center of the <coughs> mouth of the horn antenna? At the center of the mouth of the horn antenna, x dash is 0. When we put x dash is equal to 0, this will become 1. So we have e, E0 at the center of the mouth of the hand, uh, horn antenna. At the two extreme ends of the mouth, uh, at the extreme two ends of the mouth, <coughs> we'll have x dash is equal to minus a by 2 for the lower one. And this would be one of them should be positive here. In the upper end, we'll have x dash is equal to plus a by 2. So when I put x dash is equal to minus a by 2 or plus a by 2, this will become 0. So at the extreme s of the mouth of the horn antenna, the fields are 0. How about the phase variation? If you look at the phase variation at the center of the mouth of the horn antenna, x dash is 0, this will become 1 here. This will be 1. Exponential, 0 means 1. This will be 1. That means we don't have any phase variation. It is multiplied by 1. But at the two extreme edges of the mouth, where you have x dash is equal to minus a by 2 and plus a by 2, this is a maximum phase variation, exponential minus j beta divided by 8 r naught dash a square same for the other end. So what you are observing is the amplitude is maximum at the center and minimum at the two edges, which is equal to 0. And phase variation, there is no phase variation at the mouth of the center of mouth of the whole antenna. At the two extreme ed edges, we have maximum phase variation. So now that we know the field variation of the aperture antenna, we'll go to the second step for finding the fields radiated from aperture antenna. Which is basically taking the two different transform of the aperture field. So this was the aperture field. You multiply by exponential j beta x x dash, exponential j beta y y dash, and do the integration over dx dash and dy dash. Now the express uh, aperture is starting from minus a y t two plus a y two and minus b y t two plus b y two for the ice plane sectoral horn antenna. <coughs> this integration you see here, this integration is simply a sink function b times sine beta y b by 2. This is standard sink function integration. You have already done that. But this integration is little bit involved. It's already derived in uh, Balani's book as well as TLA and Strutzman book. We'll write down the expression for this int integration. This integration turns out to be e0 half square root of pi r0 dash divided by beta, then i, which is a function of theta and phi. What is this i here? This i can be expressed as a1 beta x1 fs2 dash minus fs1 dash plus a2 beta x2 ft2 dash minus ft1 dash. What is a1 and a2? a1 is simply exponential j beta r0 dash beta x. 1 whole square divided by 2 beta a2 is exponential j r0 dash beta x2 whole square by 2 beta where beta x1 is equal to beta x plus pi by a beta x2 is equal to beta x minus pi by a so you can see that a1 and a2 expression is very similar except that beta x1 should be replaced by beta x2 and beta x1 and beta x2 Relation is also very similar except that this plus sign should be replaced by minus sign. What is this function f? Function f j uh, dash is equal to c j dash minus j s j dash. So what is this c and s? c is the cosine Fresnel integration and s is the sine Fresnel integration. These are standard mathematical expression for sine and cosine Fresnel integration. So cosine Fresnel integration is integration of cosine pi by 2 tau square d tau limit from 0 to j dash. And sine integration, Fresnel integration, we are instead of cosine, you just replace this by sine. And we also have s1 dash, s2 dash, t2 dash, t1 dash. 
so s1 dash s1 by square root of pi beta r naught dash minus beta a by 2 minus beta x 1 r naught dash if i want to get s2 dash s2 dash just change this symbol minus by plus here if i want to get t1 dash i will just change this beta x1 from the first expression to beta x2 and if i want to get t2 dash i will just change this sign to plus and this one to beta x2 so if you know s1 dash you can easily write down what is s2 dash t1 dash and t2 dash and if you know what is cosine Fresnel integration you can also write down sine Fresnel integration by changing cosine to sine function so we have finished the second step we've got the Fourier transform of the aperture fields let us go to the third step the third step is use the equation 24.1 and 24.2 to find the far field radiation of the aperture antenna but in all the cases we have considered before we also assume an infinite ground plane in which we have an aperture but in the waveguide case also we have done that open-ended waveguide we assume that there is an infinite ground plane in which you have fitted a waveguide with the aperture and there is a field variation of the shape of t10 mode but for the horn antenna we don't have any infinite ground plane so the first thing is that the multiplication factor of 2 will not be there now we can we did not we need not apply the ms theorem ms principle and multiply the field radiated from the horn antenna with a factor of 2 we don't need that but there's a slight modification here since we are considering a waveguide which is feeding the horn antenna inside the waveguide dominant mode is propagating dominant mode will have both electric field and magnetic field and we have already derived the expression for the dominant mode t10 mode inside the waveguide what is the field distribution electric field distribution at the mouth of the horn antenna this was the field distribution it has only y component e0 cosine of pi x dash capital a exponential minus j beta divided by 2 r naught dash x dash whole square this was the field distribution inside the mouth of the horn antenna electric field distribution but we will also have magnetic field no? electric field and magnetic field it's a wave which is propagating inside the waveguide so we'll have electromagnetic waves electromagnetic waves will have both electric field and magnetic field they, you cannot separate it out so electric field was also there magnetic field was also there for inside the fit to the horn antenna so the horn antenna mount will also have both electric field and magnetic field so at the mouth of the horn antenna magnetic field you can simply get it as minus e a y by z g z g is the wave impedance of the dominant mode we are considering t10 mode once i have electric field i can always find magnetic field as minus e a y by z g z g is the dominant mode t10 wave impedance so then e a y will become minus s a x z g So this was the relation we have for the equation 24.1 and 24.2. This was the equation 24.1 and 24.2. Now we want to simplify and modify this relation for the horn antenna case we are considering now. So now here you have only EAY and SAX. We have only EAY and SAX since we have considered dominant T10 mode. So now in that case, SAY will be 0 and <coughs> EAX will be 0. So we can simplify this equation 24.1 and 24.2 like this. We'll have only two components here, two components here, two terms here, two terms here. <coughs> and we also have this relation here. EAY is minus SAX ZG. EAY was 
ACAXZG minus ACAXZG. <coughs> so this term looks like EAY. This term also looks like EAY for a transform of that. This term looks like EAY for a transform of that. This term also looks EAY for a transform of that. What is this eta here? Inside the waveguide. Eta for the waveguide is the wave impedance for the mode we are considering. So inside the waveguide, I can replace EAY as minus ACXZG. So in that case, the first term will also be dependent on EAY, EAY here. Second term also dependent, uh, the second term dependent on EAY here also here. So all the terms are very similar, you know, you have a contribution from EAY here, KAY here, EAY here, EAY here. <coughs> so I can take out command from here, 1 plus cosine of theta, from here also I can take out command 1 plus cosine of theta. So the final expression you have for the electric field in the far field, theta and phi component, would be J beta exponential minus J beta R by 4 pi R, 1 plus cos theta EAY sine phi. EFF phi component would be exactly same as that of EFF theta with sine theta replaced by cosine of phi. Sine phi replaced by cosine of phi. So this is a very compact expression you have for the electric field radiated from a horn antenna. So let us go back to the EAY for a transform of that. It was expressed as E0 half square root of pi r naught dash by beta i function of theta and phi then b sync function of beta y b by 2 <coughs> and this was the expression for the i i will have a1 fs2 dash minus fs1 dash plus a2 f2 t2 dash minus f t1 dash let us take particular case we are interested in e plane and x plane of the radiation pattern of the antenna so for the E-plane pattern, phi is equal to pi by 2. This is a yz plane. <coughs> if phi is pi by 2, what happens to beta x? Beta x is beta sine theta cos of phi. So this becomes 0. What happens to beta y? Beta y will become beta sine theta because sine of pi by 2 is 1. <coughs> so in that case, this EFF phi component will become 0 because we have a cosine phi here. <coughs> and this EFF theta will become this expression with sine phi is equal to pi, uh, 1. So we have EFF theta is this and EFF phi is 0 for the E-plane pattern. And beta x is 0, beta y is beta sine theta. If beta x is 0, beta x1 was beta x plus pi by a, it will be simply pi by a. Beta x2 will become beta x minus pi by a, beta x is 0, so minus pi by a. So beta x1 and beta x2 has the same expression with a sine change minus here. So if you find out a1, a1 was exponential j beta r naught dash beta x1 whole square by 2 beta so beta x1 is pi by a here and a2 is minus pi by a so minus pi by a whole square then it becomes positive <coughs> so what we are observing is that this constant a1 and a2 is equal for this particular case when we are considering the e-plane at phi is equal to pi by 2 so we can simplify this expression for i so now I will have only one constant a1 which is dependent on pi by a then this inside the bracket is fs2 dash minus fs1 dash plus ft2 dash minus ft1 dash. Even this arguments here of the function f s2 dash s1 dash t2 dash t1 dash you can find out relation between them. So s1 dash was this, s2 dash was this, t1 dash was this, t2 dash was this. Now the major simplification is that this beta x1 will be simply pi by a, beta x, this is beta x1 is pi by a, then beta x2 will be minus pi by a, so it becomes plus, this is minus pi by a becomes plus here. What you are observing is that s2 dash is equal to minus t1 dash, s1 dash is equal to minus t2 dash. 
This function f is dependent on the cosine and sine Fresnel integrals and it is known that sine and cosine Fresnel integrals are odd function. That means c minus z dash is equal to minus c z dash and s minus z dash is equal to minus s z dash. So this function itself is also a odd function f of minus z dash is equal to minus f of z dash. So final expression you have for i will be a1 pi by a2 times f s2 dash minus f s1 dash. So let us write down the electric field in the E plane. Far field is theta component is this relation you have here. But what you can observe is that the main contribution in the radiation pattern would be from here. You have 1 plus cosine theta y2 then sinc function here which is dependent on beta y. Similarly, you can also find out the h plane pattern by taking phi is equal to 0. When I take phi is equal to 0, EFF theta will become 0. EFF phi will become this. Here, beta x will become beta sine theta cos of phi and it becomes beta sine theta. Beta y will become 0. If beta y is 0, this sinc function will become 1. So, we will not have any contribution from the sinc function for the h plane pattern of the sectoral ice plane horn antenna. What happens to beta x1? Beta x1 is beta x plus pi by a. Beta x2 is equal to beta x minus pi by a. So a1 and a2 would be different now. a1 will become exponential j r0 dash beta x1 is whole square by 2 beta a2 will become exponential j r0 dash beta x2 whole square divided by 2 beta. And this sinc function will become 1 because beta y is 0. What is the value of sinc function when argument is 0? It's 1. So the final expression you have for EFF phi would be j beta b e naught exponential minus j beta r divided by 4 pi r square root pi r naught dash by beta. And this is the i function here, i which is a function of theta and phi. Then you will just have 1 plus cos theta by 2. So you can plot this radiation pattern E plane and H pattern and H plane pattern and you can see. Some of you were actually asking about the assignment. So I'll give this an assignment for you student for you all. Huh? Some of you wanted to have assignment in this course, so I will give you assignment for plotting this E plane and H plane radiation pattern of the horn antennas. And we are also interested in the directivity of the horn antenna. Directivity of the horn antenna can be found out. It's given in the Thalia and Strassman or Baralin's book. It's 4 pi by lambda square. Usually what you do is you do the aperture integration and find out the directivity. Once you know the aperture field, you can easily find out the directivity for the aperture antennas. So directivity for this horn antenna is 4 pi lambda square. 4 pi by lambda square. Efficiency for the taper, you have a cosine taper of the amplitude of the field in the mouth of the horn antenna. What is the efficiency to do that? You have already found out that no? when you have a cosine taper, the 10 0 mod kind of field in the open ended waveguide, how much was the efficiency? It was 8 by pi square, it's around 0.81. So, this, this is a contribution from the amplitude taper efficiency. <coughs> from the amplitude taper and this the efficiency due to the phase change. You have seen that <coughs> at the center of the mouth of the horn antenna, there is no phase change, but at the two edges you have maximum phase change. Because of that, how much is the efficiency of the antenna? <coughs> then what is the dimension? What is the dimension? Cross section of the op open ended horn antenna along the x-axis is capital A, along the y-axis small b, so a into b. So as I already told you, due to the taper of the amplitude of the pill variation, you will have epsilon t as 8 by pi square, which is approximately 0.81. Due to the phase taper, also you can find out it is pi square by 64 t 
CP1 minus CP2 whole square plus SP1 minus SP2 whole square. What is C and S? These are the sine and cosine, cosine and sine Fresnel integral. We already discussed that. So now question is how do I find this T here? We have a variable T here. T is actually found out for the maximum phase error. Where is the location of the mouth where you of the horn antenna where you have the maximum phase error? It's at the end end of the aperture what is the value of x dash for that x dash is a by 2 so the phase error will be beta 1 by r 2 r naught x dash whole square x dash in this case is a by 2 so the phase error maximum phase error is 2 pi a square by 8 lambda r naught dash let us equate this maximum phase error is equal to 2 pi t then t will become a square by 8 lambda r naught dash so this is the value of t we have here in this expression for the efficiency of the phase taper, uh, phase variation of the horn antenna. This is the amplitude taper. This is phase. Because of this amplitude taper and phase changes, there is some loss in the efficiency of the radiation from the horn antenna. We know what is T, but we don't know what is P1 and P2. We know these are cosine and sine Fresnel integral, but we don't know what is P1, P2. Let us find that. P1 can be found out from the S1 dash. S1 dash is what? S1 dash is 1 by pi beta R0 dash, 1 minus beta A, minus beta A by 2 minus beta X1 R0 dash. You plug in beta x1 as beta sine theta cos pi this is beta x plus pi by a and denote this sine theta cos pi by u and you put u is equal to 0 then you get p1 p1 is minus s1 dash when u becomes 0 and you can see that minus s1 dash is equal to t2 dash when u is 0 similar p2 is equal to s2 dash equal to minus t1 dash when u is 0 u is sine theta cos pi so the question is can we express p1 and p2 also in terms of t so that the expression for the directivity will be dependent on the t variable for epsilon t and epsilon uh, c basically we want to find the directivity directivity has 4 pi by lambda square lambda is the wavelength a into b so we we'll get dimension this is the 0.81 we want to find this so in this expression we want all the terms are dependent only on one variable t we have already seen that there is a dependence of this term with t so i want to express even this p1 and p2 in terms of t so that i can easily find out this epsilon due to phase changes only in terms of t so once i know t i can find out this so i want to express this p1 and p2 in terms of t So from the previous relation we have here, we know the relation between A and T. So I can express A in terms of T. I can express A as square root of 8 lambda R0 dash T. So then I can find out P1. P1 is dependent on A, A by 2, pi by A. So I replace A as square root of 8 lambda R0 dash here also. Then I simplify it. What I am seeing is that P1 has a very simple expression. Two, after simplifying, you will find out 2 square root of T 1 plus 1 by 8 T. So P2 also you can similarly find out by substituting A is equal to square root of 8 lambda R0 dash T. It's simply 2 root T minus uh, bracket minus 1 plus 1 by 8 T. So I have P1 and P2 in terms of T, so I can easily find out this epsilon due to phase variation using this relation. So I have everything, so I can find out the directivity of the horn antenna. Directivity of the horn antenna is 4 pi by lambda square, 0.81, this term here, A into B. So once I know the dimension, I know what frequency I'm want to find the directivity i know what is the lambda i know all the terms all i need is to find the t so once we have the t then we can find out 
what is the directivity of the horn antenna so uh, it has been observed that directivity is dependent on a obviously directivity will depend on a because p1 is also dependent on a p2 is also dependent on a and again you have here a is here so so here this term is dependent on a this term here we have a term here so a is directivity is definitely dependent on a capital a and people has done some study what is the variation of directivity with respect to a and it has been observed that the optimal value of a you can have to have the optimal directivity is a is equal to square root of t lambda are, are not this <coughs> once we have the a we can find out t so t for this case turns out to be when we have optimal value of a it turns out to be 3 by 8 so optimal value of t is 3 by 8 so once you have this you can find out this term here you already know this term this term this term you can find out the optimal directivity of the horn antenna so that's all for this class we have discussed about the ice plane sectoral horn antenna when we have discussed about the three motivations for going for horn antennas from the open-ended web guide we'll discuss about the two remaining horn antennas one is e plane sectoral horn antenna and another is pyramidal horn antenna in the following classes thanks for your time